I'm sorry that one of his character and profession has done so much towards weakening the arguments that are taken for the purity of our Reformation from that period, and that he has never taken particular notice of the several proceedings of our assemblies at that time for advancing the kingdom of Christ, not only in this, but in all the three nations, which the ministers of Perth and Fife and their foresaid testimony did bear a particular witness unto. And, notwithstanding of all that our author has said, it will be found that there is just ground for complaining that the judicatories of this church did neither at the revolution nor since that time bear express witness and testimony unto the faithful proceedings of that former period for carrying on a work of reformation. Our author thinks fit, with a sneer, to tell us on page 133, quote, Of what advantage could it be to revive such acts of that as that of the Assembly 1645, in which it is, in which it is enjoined, that these who are taught in Aristotle be found well instructed in his text. Unquote. It is certainly the duty of assemblies to be careful about the education of youth, especially in the colleges. We have had a swatch of late from the press by a student in Glasgow of the moral philosophy that is taught there, and I do not think it would be unworthy of the General Assembly 1639 to give such a recommendation unto the teacher and that Aristotle as the assembly did 16 as the assembly 1645 did or to recommend aristotle's ethics unto him instead of his own scheme providing the recommendation is given with some such cautions as are mentioned in the act of the assembly 1578 it will be a further evidence of the degeneracy of this church if the judicatories do not inquire into that scheme of moral philosophy that tis reported is taught here there excuse me though our author speaks every time where in a diminutive diminutive manner of the period, which he calls the extolled period, yet I hope all the sincere lovers of Scotland's covenanted reformation desire to extol the Lord, who with our outstretched arm gave a great, uh, who with outstretched arm, excuse me, gave a great and glorious deliverance unto his church in the year 1638, and who did make his great power to be known in maintaining, advancing, and carrying on his own work, until we did prove unsteadfast and perfidious in his covenant, particularly by ta taking the adversaries of his cause and interest into our bosom, as well as by other steps of backsliding from him, whereby he was provoked at last to deliver his strength into captivity, and his glory into the hands of his enemies, and to throw his people in this land, into the hot furnace of twenty-eight years tribulation and persecution. We have just ground to fear that if the Lord shall enter into judgment with us on account of the misimprovement of the deliverance given us in the year 1688 and for our manifold defections and backslidings from him since that time, a furnace seven times hotter than the former may yet be set up in Scotland. Amos 4, verse 12. Chapter 5 wherein some exceptions laid by the author of the essay against the act and testimony of the associate presbytery are considered. I have had occasion in the preceding chapters to consider several of the exceptions that are laid by our author against the act and testimony emitted by the associate presbytery. He endeavors through his whole essay to misrepresent the said testimony, sometimes by his criticisms on the words of the presbytery, and sometimes he roundly charges them with reporting what is not matter of fact, and sometimes he condemns them as justifying what he reckons to be bad acts. I have swelled this book so much already that I cannot at this time go into all our author's particular instances. I shall therefore only now touch at a few of them, which I have not noticed already, and such as appear to me to be some of the most material exceptions that are laid against the Presbytery's testimony. The Associate Presbytery in their Act and Testimony, page 17, make mention of the Act of Parliament 1649 as a laudable act, wherein it is statute and ordained that the king, before he be admitted to the exercise of the royal power, assure and declare by his solemn oath his allowance of the National Covenant and the Solemn League and Covenant, etc., as it is narrated in the testimony. This act our author reckons bad and unjustifiable in his essay, page 201. And this, says he, is evident because, quote, first, the act declares tis necessary that king and people be of one perfect religion, unquote. This our author alleges to be contrary to our Confession of Faith, chapter 23, article 4. I believe our author is the first that has discovered the contrariety he mentions. It may be obvious to everybody that the necessity intended in the preamble to the said act is that it is necessary for the good of the subject 
and for the maintenance of their religious liberties, that the king and people be of one perfect religion. Yea, that it is necessary, by virtue of the command of God, that both king and subjects be of one perfect or true religion, in regard the com in regard the command of God binds all ranks and persons, the king as well as the subject. Therefore the preamble contains a good reason for the act and statute. Again, our author reckons it hard that by that act the king should not only swear for himself but also for his successors when none could tell who they might be. But is it not as hard for parents to engage for their children when none of them can tell what they might what they may be? Was ever this quarrel by any Protestant divine? Our author may reckon Moses' words to Israel as hard in Deuteronomy 29 verse 14. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth with us here this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. But as our author is singular in many of his reasonings, so likewise in this. For by the same argument, he overthrows the obligation of all religious oaths upon posterity, which is contrary to the whole scripture. Another reason to prove the above act of parliament Another reason to prove the above act of Parliament bad is that the king was bound to swear, quote, never to endure by any alteration of the acts securing our religion. For, says he, some of these acts flood, uh, some of these acts stood, excuse me, very much in need of alteration, as particularly the act of Parliament 1592, which, though a good act in the main, says he, yet had sundry things in it very bad, unquote. What inconsistent reasoning is here? Could the bad things in any act secure our religion? Therefore it is evident that when the king swore not to alter any act securing our religion, none of the bad things in any act were sworn to be maintained. Yea, rather, by virtue of the oath he was obliged to after them. A fourth reason our author obliges a fourth reason our author gives against the act of Parliament is that the king was obliged to take a most limited uh, illimited oath, excuse me. But how is it limited? Our author tells us, quote, that the king swore for himself and for his successors to agree to all acts of parliament in joining the covenants and fully establishing Presbyterian government, unquote. He should have added the director for public worship, confession of faith and catechisms, for these are likewise mentioned in the act, and I believe anybody but our author will see that this is a very limited oath. Our author adds, quote, that by the oath administrate to King Charles at Schoon, it seems it included acts made or to be made, for, says he, the king was obliged to swear. I, for myself and successors, shall consent and agree to all the acts of parliament in joining the national covenant and the solemn league and covenant. And that I shall give my royal assent to all acts and ordinances of parliament passed or to be passed in joining the same in my other dominions." Unquote. Our author adds, quote, Here the king is sworn to what neither he nor the imposers of that oath could know what. Unquote. But in the meantime, is it not expressly declared that he should give his royal consent to acts in joining the covenants? And therefore both the king and the parliament knew very well what the oath obliged the king unto. But it seems a more than ordinary antipathy at our covenants has blinded his eyes. I know not for what reason our author has again dropped our confession of faith and catechisms, For these are only expressly mentioned in the king's coronation oath. But I shall not pursue his other two reasons against the said act of parliament. In regard, they have no more strength in them than these I have mentioned. Our author, page 102, tells his reader that the seceding brethren in their act and testimony, page 39, assert that the parliament immediately after the revolution appointed the oath of allegiance to be sworn in place of any other oaths imposed by law and acts of preceding parliaments. Our author's first observe is that the brethren never tell which of all the nine sessions of King William's first parliament it was. There are many such omissions in our author's essay. We must sometimes search through a whole book for his citations, as in the citations he gives us from Turretin, essay page 27 to 28, yea, through many books, as in the citation he gives us from Durham, page 63. But our author has fallen upon the act of parliament, which he makes no doubt we intend. And, according to him, it is the second act of the second session of King William and Queen Mary's first parliament. Yet there is no such clause as he himself quotes to be found in that act, but the reader may find it in the second act of the first session of the said parliament, 
where it is said that, quote, the Parliament do hereby retract and rescind all pre preceding laws and acts of Parliament, insofar as they impose any other oaths of allegiance, supremacy, declarations, and tests, excepting the oath del fideli, unquote. Uh, de fideli, excuse me, unquote. And this act of Parliament bears an express reference unto the claim of right, the last article whereof declares, quote, that the oath hereafter mentioned, that is, the oath of allegiance, be taken by all Protestants of whom the oath of allegiance and any other oaths and declara declarations might be required by law instead of them, and that the said oath of allegiance and other oaths and declarations may be abrogated, unquote. Our author thinks fit to exclaim against the brethren and alleges that they take a liberty of altering and changing the words of acts of Parliament, that they make them speak what, what they never intended. He likewise alleges that nothing is meant by the oaths mentioned in the Act of Parliament and Claim of Right, but the sinful oaths in the former period, which were still enforced by law, etc. But the brethren in their testimony did foresee the above objection, and therefore they explain themselves in the following manner, quote, Yet, say they, the terms in which the Act of Parliament is conceived appear plainly to exclude the oath of the covenant, which contained a very solemn test of allegiance to the sovereign, especially when it is considered that the above-mentioned Act Recissory was not repealed, unquote. By the Act Recissory, they mean the Act passed in the first session of King Charles II in Parliament, anon 1661, whereby all the parliaments of our reforming period, as also all their acts and deeds, were declared null and void. Hence it is obvious that the strength of the brethren's reasonings upon this head does not lean to the words of the Act of Parliament rescinding all preceding laws, insofar as they impose any other oaths of allegiance. But what they assert, uh, but they assert, excuse me, what is plain matter of fact, that is, that our covenant allegiance was left buried by the Parliament in 1690, and that instead of retrieving our covenant allegiance, the oath of allegiance contained in their act is imposed, and therefore they justly argue that the above act of Parliament is conceived in such terms as plainly appear, as appear plainly to exclude the oath of the covenant. And for this same reason they affirm in page 46, quote, that the oath of abjuration together with the allegiance is substitute in the room of our solemn national covenants, which contain the strictest engagements of duty to the sovereign, a most solemn renunciation of popery, and consequently of all po pro popish pretenders whatsoever, unquote. And for what our author alleges, page 107, quote, to me, says he, it is unfair in the brethren and these who now exclaim against the abjuration, that they never mention the different forms or drafts thereof, as if there had not been the least appearance of difference between them. Unquote. I answer, they did not think it needful to mention these, difference, these different forms or drafts. In regard, they judged that in all its several forms and drafts, the United Constitution was homogolate. The author of the essay charges the brethren with asserting in their testimony Several things which are not matter of fact, as essay page 191, he says, they assert all the prelates were deposed from the ministry, that is, by the Assembly 1638, Act and Testimony, pages 14 and page 40. This, says our author, is not matter of fact, but the brethren say no such thing as our author alleges, for in both places quoted by him, they say only that all the bishops were deposed, that all the bishops were deposed. These words from the ministry are an addition of his own, and he may the more easily fix a falsehood that he may more easily fix a falsehood upon the testimony. But tis plain that all the prelates were deposed by the assembly sixteen thirty eight from their pretended episcopal function. Two of them were suspended only from the ministry for the reasons I have already given, and when the brethren say they were all they were all deposed, excuse me, they speak according to the title of the several acts relative unto them. They speak likewise in the style of all the writers at that time, and in the express words of the ministers of Perth and Fife and their testimony. The author of the essay, page 97, takes notice of the following assertion in the Act and Testimony, page 42, where speaking of the declarations of the Commission of the General Assembly and their petitions against the Union, they say, quote, But as the ensuing General Assembly only approved of the proceedings of this Commission in common form without an express approbation of their conduct in the particular, though matters of less moment, have sometimes been particularly noticed, unquote. 